Thank you so much, Mr. Santanam, for setting the tone for this summit. We now move to the keynote addresses titled Best Global Practices for Sustainability. We have two eminent speakers. The first, a global architect, very eminent, Mr. James Law, Mr. Santanam alluded to that, Chairman and CEO and Chief Cybertech, James Law Cybertecture, and the second speaker, Mr. Thomas L. Wajda, the U.S. Consul General, Mumbai, representative of one of our partnering countries for the 100 Smart Cities Project. I first invite Mr. James Law, also the young leader of the Economic Forum, to present his keynote address titled, Urban Ovation. Ladies and gentlemen, kindly put your hands together for Mr. James Law. Good morning. Um, I'd like to first thank uh, Sangoban and uh, the Economic Times for inviting me to be your opening keynote speaker today. Um, what I'm going to talk about is a new movement, I believe, in how we're going to be designing and building the world. And I call that in two words, cybertecture and urban innovation. Cybertecture means an integration of the knowledge and application of our design skills with our technological skills. In fact, we are surrounded by a world which is already created out of science. And in the times to come, the opportunities are there for us to build a better world through an integration of both those things. But immediately facing us is the issue of urbanization. And that's why today I'd like to introduce to you this idea of urban innovation. Urban innovation is the integration of urban issues and innovation. And together, these two words represent some of the greatest opportunities for us to rebuild our world, to make it more sustainable, more economically powerful, and most importantly, alleviate the suffering of the people that live in our cities. We have seen our cities change over time. And in fact, when you look at this slide, you might expect a city to be defined by the picture on the top half of the image. But in fact, the city below is actually newer than the city at the top. The city at the top is Hong Kong, my home city. It's an economically powerful city. But it is, in a way, under decline because now the world economy is not so strong. The city below is growing at an even faster rate. In fact, the city below is a million-person city created in less than six months and has been made out on the borders of Syria by the refugees who have escaped their war-torn country. We are facing these issues as we design our cities in the future, and we must bear in mind that as people come together to live, we need to design them better under different and difficult circumstances. Throughout the eons, uh, as man has created his urban environment, we have always been at odds with our relationship between the built and the natural, the green and the grey, the soft and the hard. That dichotomy, that struggle, continues today. And in fact, this conference is very much about looking at those opportunities and those overlaps which allow us to bring the flavour of both to the lives of the people that will be living in the newly designed cities. But of course, also, we should not forget about our culture. The lady on the left-hand side is uh, doing Chinese opera, which is my culture, my heritage. But we are now beginning to see our cultures through new lenses, through, like the person on the right-hand side, virtual reality. We are looking at the world differently. And as all of us are agents of change, professionals, designers, constructors, manufacturers, scientists, we are beginning to see our world differently, but not necessarily having to uh, be rid of what is very important to us, which is our traditions and our cultures. This side represents perhaps the most tangible uh, challenge we're facing in the urbanized world, which is that of space. The top half of the picture shows an eight-person family living in Hong Kong in less than 300 square foot of space. 
I know this is not just happening in Hong Kong. We see them happening here even in Mumbai. And the picture below is a project we recently completed which allows the same 400 square foot apartment to seemingly feel infinite in size using virtual reality. Now I'm not saying that technology will solve the real tangible space issues, but we know for the fact that as 9 billion people towards the end of the decade will be living in urbanized areas, we will not be able to afford nice garden villas with trees and lovely gardens around us like the Leela. But we may need to use other technologies to bring that to bear so that people can still have that kind of, uh, have that kind of benefit. And the way that we are going to build is going to be very different. Even from the video that Sangoban was showing about the technology and development, makes me wonder about how and what materials will be building the architectures of the future. On the left-hand side is public housing that's been built in Hong Kong since the 1960s, made out of concrete, steel and glass. On the right-hand side is a new system of building using mostly aluminium that allows the same building with the same capacity to be built at one-fifth of the weight, at one-fifth of the time, at one-half of the cost. These are the advances that are now made available to us as we look at the cyber tech opportunities in terms of urban innovation. We are living in an increasingly connected world. Those issues that we face are connected. We are connected to each other. We share our innovations, we share our ideas. Great innovations and creations that are created maybe in Asia will soon be pervasive in the West, but also the West towards the East. We have much to learn from each other. But most importantly, I believe urban innovation and cybertecture is a movement about collaboration. It is about sharing those problems and challenges that we are seeing and sharing the ideas and the creativity that we have to solve these issues together. No one company, no one society, no one country will be able to solve these by themselves. And what is our goal? The goal is very much that this planet is our one own home. And we were blessed once upon a time with a pure planet, able to sustain all manners of life. Of course, that sustaining of life wasn't actually in tune with the development of humanity. We have developed much faster than most. But perhaps we have a responsibility, therefore, to design our own humanity so that we are not destroying the planet, but in fact offering a kind of new balance with our planet. I'm going to go into this topic in a few more uh, specific details. First of all, an idea about smart infrastructure under the term of urban innovation. Of course, every city is a mass of infrastructure. We look at it very much as the underlying mesh that is powering our cities. But I propose that we should be more brave than that. We should see that infrastructure is very much the urbanized matrix that we live in. And in fact, some of the uh, fiction that we're looking at, including um, you know, science fiction, even in the new technologies of space flight, space X, etc., are leading us to see that infrastructure is very much about a new way of life. The infrastructure of going to space, space tourism, going to live on the sea, under the sea. And so we have already begun to do projects like this. This is a new city, not designed like a typical sprawling city, but a city designed like a mini planet, an infused and dense piece of infrastructure, more efficient and more capable than the sprawling metropolises that we are building today. This is a real project that is now under construction in the United Arab Emirates. It will be a home for 25,000 people to live and work. They will use 30% less water. We'll need to generate less energy to power the living and the working within this building. And the whole structure is one giant piece of infrastructure designed to be very efficient. These are all ideas that we've generated from infrastructure design and architecture, learning from our planet. Inside this technosphere is a naturally ventilated 100 meter tall valley able to keep people safe and cool. At the bottom of this valley will be a river, very much like the traditional rivers we see in our natural valleys, 
But these valleys will be able to uh, circulate and clean the water within this technosphere and recycle it for the people living and working inside. We need to build these because we can no longer build the typical cities that we are building today. Buildings can't get any much smaller and denser. We must look at the way in which we plan our cities differently and to bring back nature into our cities. But not just as a kind of prestige or aesthetic, but very much part of the ecology of a new mini planet. In fact, this kind of approach is so audacious and iconic, some people might say, oh, this is not possible. But the same kind of sentiments would have failed things like sending people to the moon, or achieving nuclear power, or to um, really solve some of the medical challenges that we've seen in humanity. I really believe that uh, smart infrastructure is the start of a big scale change in our cities. By building structures like this, not only do we bring nature back, but we free up space around these uh, globes. And around them we can generate the green areas that our citizens need. We can even transplant some of the nature from around the world onto this globe, allowing people to experience different kinds of foliage, different kinds of animal life, bird life and fish life from around the world. Now from the very large structure, I don't want you to feel that it is all about giant interventions. It is also about the individual. So the next thing I want to talk about is smart lifestyle in terms of urban innovation. We're living in a world where the personal empowerment of their life comes from individual handheld technology, the connection to the internet, the ability to look beyond, and the ability to afford technology in their hand. But this kind of approach has not really been transferred to the fabric of our cities in terms of our architecture. And this man, who we all know, uh, really changed the way in which we see space. I mean, not many people interpret it that way, but in his hand is actually a building that contains gigabytes of virtual space. That space being your life, your photos, your songs, your emails, etc., or in your hand. We have not yet built buildings like that, but we are beginning to. And this is the building we just built in Dubai. It's called the Pad, and it's a building that takes a direct analogy to an iPhone. In fact, the Pad building was originally called the iPad before Apple produced the product, the iPad. The idea behind this building is that every building like this will be able to download apps individual to your lifestyle. If your lifestyle is into sports, your apartment becomes sports orientated. If your, li if your life is about meditation, you can download apps that help you live a more balanced life. That space that you live in is no longer just confined by its physical space or even its material space, but very much by the lifestyle that you want to live in the very same way that my iPhone would have installed different apps from your iPhone. And this approach to this new kind of architecture allows these buildings to be individually customized to the lifestyle of each person that lives in them. They become giant computers that, as you walk in, becomes a platform upon which you are installing your particular operating system. And I think it's a very exciting new change in architecture. In fact, this building is so powerful in its technology, we're able to use one room via Airbnb as a hotel, but another room as your own particular studio or office. It's the same building, no longer spread between a hotel architecture and a residential architecture or an office architecture. It becomes a programmable architecture. And we really see a lot of potential in this. Imagine a city where we are no longer confined by zones of particular use. A central business district can be reprogrammed into a hotel district and a residential district can be reprogrammed into an innovation district. Very exciting. Inside, to deal with the spatial issues, we use virtual reality in all the apartments, able to link every space to any other space in the world via the internet. We're able to detect the moods of the people. You can change the physical feeling within the space depending on, on how you feel. And that, again, is a new smart material approach which traditional materials can no longer do. All of these apartments are smart and they're pre-designed. 
they're not like the traditional architecture where we build them as we go. They're pre-designed and pre-built in a factory and then installed. And even the physical aspects of the space here in the living room, your furniture can rotate on the round table, able to reorientate the way in which your furniture sees the view outside the building. It's a very kind of exciting development in architecture, which takes it into the realm of cybertecture. It is no longer just about the building. It is about how you live in the building. In fact, how we live is often very much tied into our health. If we are not healthy, we are not living well. So here in this building, every bathroom is empowered with our new technology called Cybertecture Health. And every mirror in the bathroom automatically detects the level of your health and guides you in your daily life in terms of your diet and your exercise. In your reflection, applications pop out depending on the data that has been acquired in order to gauge and help you modulate your life. Your cybertecture is now your friend. Your cybertecture is now your health advisor. And this is not uh, science fiction. This is a real piece of technology and is now readily available to be installed in any building around the world. You know, this thing called the Internet of Things allows most of the devices that we normally see in our architecture to now be connected to the Internet. They can be upgraded. They can have applications added to them. They can be empowered to be customized to you. And they can interface with you via your smartphone or in the future other wearable devices. That will change very much the fabric of how we build our buildings and how we live in our buildings. The third topic I want to talk about is smart architecture, urban innovation. And I wanted to say that as architects, we are often faced with this challenge of building a new building. And we are always asked, you know, in the world of green buildings, do green buildings have to be very green in terms of having a lot of plants on them, etc.? That is one approach to being green. But I think it's actually kind of a retro idea. There are more innovative ideas. So I took an example of a building uh, just about a kilometer and a half from here, which we did um, a, uh, a few years ago, which is the Deutsche Bank headquarters, and it's called the Capital in Bandra Kula Complex. And it's a very, very highly graded green building with a lot of smart systems, a lot of uh, intelligent glass, a lot of high-performance glass. But very much a building of the 21st century is a commercial building, but we built into this building aspects of green, which is not directly green in terms of foliage, but green in terms of people. So here you see in the center of the facade, we've gouged out this egg shape. And this egg shape is an intervention into this building to create a different lifestyle for people. What you see from the view here is in fact a series of very large 2,000 to 3,000 square foot terraces which become uh, sky gardens for individual offices. You are able to use those terraces for, you can use it as an urban farm, you can use it as a meditation platform, you can use it as an outdoor meeting area, a party area. And these platforms are the green interventions. In fact, what I wanted to say is that a lot of the image we see of green architecture is about putting a lot of green in the building. That's one way. But in fact, human sustainability is really even more important than the uh, addition of green foliage. It is very much about uh, knowing and enabling those people to work and live in a more uh, kind of balanced way. So the architecture is very much about people. It's about creating spaces in this building that people can share, have a lot of happy events at, uh, spaces which use a lot of natural materials to show people that even within a glass box, we can have a lot of uh, connection to nature. And I think this is a kind of new approach to commercial building designs that are moving away from the traditional, oh, high-tech, just being sleek. It is very much more about the workers inside. The next topic I just want to say is about smart green. And again, it's not about green in terms of plants, but green in terms of the nature of nature. Nature teaches a lot, us a lot about how we can build differently. There are projects around the world which has learned from nature in order to create nature. And I believe there's a lot of opportunities in architecture to create that. 
And this is a building that we hope will soon start work here in the city. It's a, uh, again an office building, but designed around nature. It's like a seed pod that is designed with a certain orientation to take on the least amount of sun, so it can save around 15 to 20 percent of the energy that is powering this building. And it also uses a lot of intelligence. Another aspect of nature is that there's a high complexity now able to be touched with the latest design technologies that we are available in our studios. And that allows us to design buildings which are very kind of um, uh, intricately sculpted, but very, very performance related. It is going to be like designing an aircraft rather than designing a building. And these kind of architecture, I think, will reshape what we call green architecture in our future cities. They will no longer just be the square blocks. They will become oasis of both art and culture. They will give delight to people because they have a higher level of sophistication than the things that we are currently building. And they will bring to us a kind of pride that uh, our civic architecture can touch now into a whole new realm of vocabulary. My last topic is perhaps, I think, the most exciting thing for me personally at the moment is something that my studio has been working on for the last year. It's about smart mobility, urban innovation. And many of you might expect me now to show you uh, a series of slides of you know, robotic cars and Uber and things like this, but this is not what I'm going to show you. I'm going to show it to you again in the context of cyber texture. Um, first thing I want to say is that in a way, funnily enough, in the world of uh, changing issues, the way in which we're perceiving our lives have changed a lot. And in fact, this little slide, I love this slide because it's a, it's a young man in his rather clapped out uh, you know, Volkswagen van and he's decked it out with a bit of technology, he stuffed his wardrobe in there and he's living probably a very happy life because he's now able to feel he's not uh, entrenched anywhere, he can pursue his dreams and he can explore the world. And I think that is the opportunity that most people really love to have in this life. Uh, although we may not be able to afford it in private jets and first class. There is a, a new kind of mobility that we are all craving for. And that mobility is already starting to be pervasive in our industry. Um, everything from the cars that we build, the caravans that we build, to now portable architecture and the way in which we build things, which are increasingly light and robotized in this industrialization. And in fact, you know, we have, to, we have to start to ask ourselves, why do our buildings and our cities have to be so hard that we need to break them and we have to knock them down and demolish them after 50 years when we could actually play with them like Lego blocks and actually change them as our society needs to be massaged or our economy starts to shift in direction. But our cities are not uh, soft enough to deal with those issues. And so for the last year, we've been working on this project called the Alpod, Alpod standing for AL, for those of you who study chemistry, and of course there are many of you because you're all working for saint Gobain, is uh, aluminium and pod being a portable kind of architecture. And we decided to build um, a 450 square foot portable architecture able to be lived in by a family of two. And uh, it will have uh, all built-in systems of uh, bathroom, kitchen, uh, environmental systems, home automation, smart energy, batteries, etc all built in a way that is economical, light, and transportable. And this approach is a whole new approach for us with our architecture. We are now building them in automated plants in China, and we are making them at a rate of two a day. So we have already got a robotized um, production line of two a day, and we can really scale that up. We can create this at a cost of less than uh, 40,000 US dollars a unit and we can ship them anywhere in the world. They're light enough to be carried by helicopter, by truck, etc., and can be deployed in less than three hours. The house is extremely high-tech. It has an extremely high-performance skin, able to deal with Arctic conditions to the tropics, and uh, it, it saves about 30% of the water that you use because it has a new generation water recycling system. And it also has an emergency battery system able to sustain your life in there for four days in case you are uh, cut off from the city grid. Um, we did this because we wanted to prove that architecture didn't have to be solid and static and, and hard. 
we ship this around different cities around the world. It's going to be going to Milan, Seoul, Chicago, Hong Kong, and Shanghai next year. You see here, this is a time lapse of the two hour setup process. Basically, it's delivered by truck, placed into location, switched on. Just like when you get an iPhone out of the box, it's basically a plug and play kind of installation. We feel that construction may no longer need to be three years or four or five years long. It is very much a cutback process because the world needs to react fast and we need to build our cities quicker. And this Alpod is the first step in a strategy of ours that looks at how our future cities can become more flexible. So we built these Alpods and we placed them in Hong Kong in different locations and let people live in them, try them out and experiment with them. You see here, we go inside, the whole house is built on the inside and outside, just like an aircraft. All of it is aluminium, except for the floor and the glass from St. Gobain. And uh, the, 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 the idea is that the aluminium can be recycled. So after three or four years, should you not want your house, we can recycle your house up to 90% of the aluminium weight. Um, so it is an extremely flexible and extremely green approach. It has a uh, sustainable toilet system, it has a waterless uh, urinal, and it has a water recycling system for the potable water behind, and it even has one of those cyber protection mirrors that I showed you before that tracks your health. Built-in kitchens, and then it can be placed anywhere, literally anywhere. Um, if you want to be on the top of a mountain, or if you want to be by the sea, or you can be by a lake, this is the kind of mobility that I believe the world will be. Uh, we will no longer just be confined by our, our dress, but we'll start to live more transient lives that are more colorful and more empowered. Now, the second step to this is that we are making our outpots into a building system. This is a model of a building we propose to build in Chicago. Um, it will be, uh, half of it will be an artist colony, and the other half will be an Airbnb kind of a hotel and the pods will be uh, delivered straight from our robotized factory straight onto this building and cut down on the actual construction of the site itself. And it's a very kind of exciting um, breakthrough because this whole building, which has 50 units, can be built in six months. So normally a 10-story building would take at least a year to two years to build. Here you can build it in six months at a quality and a cost at about half of what you need to build at the moment. Um, and then we are really excited about pushing this concept even further. As we know, in our urbanized world, 10 floors is not enough. We're going to be starting to build taller and taller. The question is, how are we going to get these pods to above 10 floors? So what we've decided to do is we are now working with a China aerospace company, and we are now building our first flying Alpod which will be flying with autonomous giant flying drones. We hope to have that flying within 24 months, and it will self-navigate to your building. I think the idea here is very much that we're going to change the whole construction process, that these um, flying autonomous uh, Alpods will be able to be delivered to the site. You, when you move homes, you literally fly your home somewhere else, it will alleviate the traffic away from the ground level, which is where our current city planning is struggling with, the kind of traffic which is bottling up our cities and the dirty construction traffic. These outposts will fly autonomously, almost in swarms, to different locations. And you can think about the potentials behind that, not only just for construction, but for fast deployment and necessary for, uh, for creating uh, mass settlements or small to medium-sized settlements. When you have disaster situations like the tsunami and earthquakes, it is very difficult for uh, uh, aid workers to produce uh, the camps fast enough for the survivors. But more or less, those are very temporary anyway. And most uh, disaster areas in the world need at least 10 years to rebuild. Our Alpods have a living shelf life of 60 years. So we can fly these Alpods into position and we can deploy them very, very quickly to create a mini city. Now that mini city is, I think, I think the step into a whole new generation of city. One day we might be faced with catastrophic weather conditions necessary for us to move our entire city from one location to another to escape storms, to escape radiation, to uh, escape the weather, etc. 
and we need a whole new kind of infrastructure. And I think our part is an example. I'm not saying this is the definitive way. Uh, it's a way in which we can consider the flexibility and the movability, the smart mobility of cities in the future. So just to show you that we are so committed, on the very first day that we had an idea about this, uh, my colleagues immediately built a drone in our uh, studio and we've started to fly them. We've developed a software that is going to guide them around the city using very similar technologies as Uber uh, to guide them from location to location and we are now doing the scale-up process. So I'd like to end now by saying that we are really, I believe, at a renaissance. We are in a time where we are knowledgeable enough and lucky enough to have been educated and we are in the pursuit of knowledge and science. We are at the cusp of facing huge global issues of climate change, uh, uh, economic uncertainty, political uncertainty. Design plays a big role in helping us do that and in fact humanity has always designed a better place for themselves and now we have to keep doing that. So that's urban innovation and cyber Thank you very much.